So hi, everybody. Today I'm going to talk about psychology and marketing and how cognitive biases influence us online. So first of all, what's a cognitive bias? So this is how Wikipedia defines uh, that. And it's a pattern of deviation in judgment where we reason about the situation in an illogical fashion. So uh, pattern means that it's something uh, that's repeatable, right, and somewhat predictable. And uh, a deviation in judgment means it's um, not how we would usually behave. And finally, uh, an illogical fashion means it's something that's um, not 100% um, logical and not how, probably not like in our own best interest. So for me, those are like the three uh, main things in a, a bias. It's repeatable, it's not how we would usually act, and uh, it's not in our own interest. So, uh, how this talk is going to work is we're going to look at uh, these 11 psychological effects and for each of them I'm going to show you uh, an illustration of how it can be used online in marketing or design or other fields. And the first one is something that's called the anchoring effect. So the anchoring effect. Well, when you have these two anchors, it looks like the one uh, on the left here is big and the one on the right is small. But if we add a, a third one, this new anchor seems a lot bigger and then the one that looked big before now seems uh, medium sized. So the anchoring effect states that when our brains uh, encounter a new situation, they, you know, they use the information that's available to make the judgment the best way they can. Here's a practical example. So um, this is a, an online course to learn lettering, so like calligraphy and drawing nice letters. And um, the, the guy selling that course has uh, three packages. And what's interesting is the way uh, the packages are laid out on the page. So as you scroll down, um, you'll see these three packages. And the first one you see is actually the most expensive at uh, $299. And then the second one costs $99 and last one $29. So the effect here is that the first one you see will seem pretty expensive, right? $299, that's a lot. But then in comparison, $99 will seem pretty reasonable and then $29 will seem downright cheap. And you can imagine that if you had reversed the order of the prices, uh, the effect would be totally different, right? $29 would seem okay, maybe a bit expensive, and then $99 would be really expensive, and $299 is like out of this world. So uh, this is a very practical example of anchoring people on a higher price so the other ones seem lower. Now, the second effect I want to talk about is called the fear of missing out. And that's something that's super common, uh, not just online, but also in daily life. And it states that when we think uh, an opportunity is going to disappear, we start valuing it a lot more. Uh, it, it's the principle behind the uh, seasonal sales. You know, there's this uh, really nice uh, jacket that's 50% off. And... Uh, the sale ends in a week, so you're going to buy it right away. And who knows, maybe if the sale was permanent, uh, you would think twice and maybe not buy it. So if you can make people uh, afraid of missing out, uh, it's a very, very strong trigger. Here's a pretty good example from a, a service called Webinar Jam, some kind of webinar thing. And as you can see, they have this huge countdown right there. And it says, don't miss out on this special offer. And uh, yeah, the idea is if you let the countdown run out, you won't be able to enjoy the 40% off discount. Although in this specific case, I wouldn't worry too much because uh, I originally 
uh, first did this talk uh, six months ago, and I took that screenshot six months ago. But I checked that site today, and the countdown is still running. <laughs> so um, yeah, you, you probably won't miss out anytime soon. The next one is the halo effect. So uh, yeah, it's not that halo. It's this halo. So by halo, I mean a, a positive glow around something that's uh, really good or really valuable. In this case, uh, Kim Il-sung, the great leader or dear leader, I don't remember, of North Korea. So the halo effect states that, um, well, when you have something that has positive qualities, those qualities can easily transfer to similar or nearby things, even if those other things don't have these qualities. Uh, a very common example is when you go on uh, e-commerce sites, they always have these bank logos and uh, PayPal logos and so on. And they're hoping that the, the aura of security around the bank will also transfer to their own products. And that actually works pretty well. Here's an example that I really like from a site called uh, Crew. So what Crew does is they, they match up uh, startups and companies with freelance designers and developers. And so they have these uh, logos of various companies like Google and Nike and BBC. So, you know, pretty major players. But if you take a better look at what it says right there, it says, awesome folks our members have worked with. So they're not actually saying that these companies have hired crew. They're saying that the people, the members of crew, have worked with these companies sometime in their lives. <laughs> so uh, they, they found this kind of hack to, uh, to uh, enjoy the ha halo of Google, Dropbox, uh, Nike, without actually having any kind of uh, real link to them. The next one, uh, loss aversion, is a very, very strong effect that's been studied a lot in uh, a lot of psychological studies and behavioral economics studies. And uh, it states that, let's say you get a gift of a certain value and it makes you happy of a certain amount, let's say uh, 10 happiness points. Well, losing this gift will uh, make you unhappy of 20 happiness points. So in other words, we value losses more than gains. And uh, yeah, we don't like losing. Nobody uh, likes to lose. And uh, this is used a lot, especially in uh, copywriting and marketing. For example, the, the tagline here in the bottom says, stop losing money to failed charges. And this is a very strong trigger because the message here is that the, you know, that the money is already yours. It's already in your bank account. But because you're uh, not doing something, uh, the money is being taken away from you and you're missing out on uh, extra re revenue. So presumably by giving them your email and getting their free course, you can learn how to avoid that from happening. The next one is called the bandwagon effect and, uh, or uh, peer pressure. It's kind of the same idea. And it, it will be very familiar with, to anybody who's been to high school, which I assume is most of you guys. And um, you know, in high school, you always have these popular uh, cliques or trans bands and so on. And that's basically the bandwagon effect. So it states that when something gets more popular, that in itself um, increases its value in, in people's eyes. Um, here's an example on a Basecamp site. So it says, just last week, 5,094 companies signed up for Basecamp. And you know, when I read this, I'm like, oh wow, if 5,094 companies signed up, there, they, there must be something there, right? I, I wanna be one of the cool kids and uh, use Basecamp as well. So um, it, it's a very, also another very strong trigger and a good way to convince people that your product is valuable. But what's interesting is that uh, the opposite effect is also true in some cases. 
So it's called a snob effect, and uh, or you could call it the hipster effect maybe. <laughs> and it's like the more popular something gets, uh, the least valuable it seems. Um, an example I like is uh, Dribble. So Dribble is a community for designers, and it's invite only. And when it launched, invites were very, very hard to get. So I don't know who here got a Dribble invite like in the first couple months, but it was pretty tough. And uh, there were like people were begging on Twitter, and there were whole communities that uh, popped up just to get Dribble invites. And I think it's a good illustration of the the snob effect, right? Because Dribble was so exclusive, uh, it made it seem uh, a lot more valuable in people's eyes. So this one is actually uh, one of my favorite uh, biases because it's something that not only affects us online and in daily life, but also affects uh, scientific studies and newspaper articles, and it's called survivorship bias. And survivorship bias states that, let's say you have a group with uh, a couple members, and there's some kind of process that kills off uh, some members of this group. So when people come in and are now confronted with the remaining members of the group, uh, they very rarely stop to think that the group was bigger to begin with. So we, we just see what's in front of our eyes and it's very hard to imagine that maybe there were more people to begin with. And there's a, a very interesting uh, story from uh, World War II about uh, this survivorship bias. So during World War II, uh, the Allies were uh, bombing German cities a lot, but they had a problem which was that uh, the Germans didn't really like being bombed too much. So um, they kept shooting their planes down. And obviously, like, a plane is expensive. You don't want it to get shot down. So the Allies needed to find a solution. And, um, well, one simple solution would be adding armor to the plane. The problem is that the more armor you add, the heavier the plane gets. And, you know, it uses more fuel. It can't fly as far, and then it can't reach its target. So they needed to be very selective about where to put that armor. And so they, they looked at the planes that they had in their big plane warehouse, and they saw that the, the planes had a lot of uh, bullet holes in a few specific places, like the, the wings and the, the tail and so on. So the first, the first uh, instinct would be to say, okay, we'll add armor to the places that have the most bullet holes, because that's where people are shooting, right? But they also brought in a, a statistician, and that guy said that, no, actually, you want to put the armor to the places that didn't have any bullet holes, because you're trying to figure out which part of the plane is most sensitive, right? And if a plane gets shot in the wing or the tail, and it can make it all the way back to the warehouse to be inspected, it means the, the damage wasn't that bad. But if it got shot in one of the other places and crashed, well, it would never make it back. It wouldn't survive that process. So those were the, the most dangerous areas. So um, I really like this story. And uh, while researching all this, I, I found another story more recent that also illustrates this bias. So I don't know if anybody remembers that, but during the World Cup, there was this rumor spreading around that somebody had been able to predict the results of the World Cup. And they had done that by uh, posting on Twitter a week before the World Cup. And um, after the fact, they, they revealed their tweet, and uh, people, yeah, people saw that they were able to predict not only the, the winning team, which would be uh, pretty good, but also um, the winning score and even the, the name of the, the, the player who had scored the, the last goal. So does anybody have a, an idea how, they, how that person managed that? So some of the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what they did was they created like 
50 different Twitter accounts uh, and had like 50 tweets, one for each possible outcome. So Brazil winning, Germany winning, uh, like 2-0, 3-0, and so on. And then after the fact, they just deleted all the wrong ones and they, they were left looking like a genius because they had been able to predict the outcome. So um, yeah, if you're aware of survivorship bias, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, when you explain it, but if you're not, you know, there's no easy explanation, like was Twitter hacked? Is uh, FIFA corrupt? Which it probably is, but. <laughs> um, this this uh, article, uh, let me read you their, their uh, explanation at the end. It says, some have said the Illuminati, a satanic cult that is rumored to include celebrities like Jay-Z and Beyonce, is behind the Twitter page and Germany winning over Argentina. So I think it won over Brazil, right? But okay. Anyway, so yeah, if you um, if you, if you know about survivorship bias, there's a, like an obvious explanation. If not, the the second best guess is the Illuminati, apparently. Sunk costs. So that's another uh, very common effect and one that affects, I think, everybody uh, almost every day. And it states that the more uh, time and resources and effort you invest in something, the more value it takes uh, in your eyes. And you know, that, that, make, that makes sense, right? Um, the thing is, sometimes the, the effort you've invested in the past is irrelevant from the value that something has right now. So a good example would be uh, like the Vietnam War, right? The US uh, sent a ton, of, a ton of soldiers, they invested a lot of dollars, uh, resources, but it was plain to see that the war wasn't really achieving anything for them. Like, what were they doing in Vietnam in the first place? The thing is, after they had invested all that, it was very hard to pull back and uh, admit defeat and admit their mistake in the first place. So they kept piling on more and more resources and uh, the war took uh, a lot longer than it should have. I believe that's also the principle behind games like Farmville. So, uh, you know, these games are like uh, very enjoyable, very fun in the beginning, and they push you to, uh, to, to buy some coins and uh, buy some sheep or cows or whatever, spend more time. And little by little, the game starts being less fun. But because you've already invested so much in the game in the beginning, it's very hard to quit. Because quitting would be admitting that all that was for nothing in a way. So uh, even if the game is not fun, it's like a grind, you, you still keep on playing forever until you die. <laughs> Hopefully not. But. The number precision effect. So have you ever wondered why, uh, like in supermarkets, the prices are always like uh, these weird odd numbers and not like just a round price? Well, studies have shown that uh, people will actually spend more for some reason when the prices are not round. And I think this is all, can also be used to, uh, to increase your uh, credibility. So if we go back to our previous examples, uh, the webinar thing had uh, 11,560 customers. Basecamp had 5,094 companies. And I feel like if they had said 10,000 customers and 5,000 companies, it wouldn't be as credible because you might think, well, you know, they could be making this whole thing up. But if it's 5,094, you're like, well, why would they make up this specific number, right? So even like subconsciously, it kind of gives a, a stronger sense of credibility to the number, I think. Uh, the IKEA effect, I really like that one. It states that um, when we build something ourselves, uh, the fact that we built it gives it more value. So it works for Lego, it works for uh, IKEA, you know, you have this uh, chair that you really like, because you built it yourself, even though it's pretty crappy and you could buy the same one anywhere else. And um, online, you can use it too. For example, this is a company called Moo. They uh, print business cards. 
And uh, not only do they let you print uh, business cards, but you can also design them. So they have this uh, business card design widget where you can enter your, the content, tweak the, the, the font, the colors, and so on. And you know, after you've spent like 15 minutes tweaking the, the perfect business card, I think you, you're starting to feel pretty attached to your design. And I'm willing to bet that that widget has pretty good conversion rates. Finally, the zero price effect. So this is just a fancy way of saying that we really like free stuff. And um, it's actually a little bit more subtle than this because basically when you discount something by 80%, uh, of course that will make people very happy. But then if you remove the last 20% to make it completely free, that will make, it, make people really, really happy. Even though the difference, uh, the absolute difference in value is smaller, that free uh, price point is kind of magical. You know, it has a, a very strong uh, influence on us. And of course, online there's all these uh, companies that have a free tier or a free sample or free plan. There's always free uh, in there somewhere. So, we've seen these uh, 11 psychological effects and now let's give it a shot ourselves and try to design the ultimate landing page. So, first we'll need the tagline. Stop losing sales now. Right away we're using like uh, loss aversion. You're losing sales right now and only us. We're the only ones that can stop it. We'll reinforce that with a, a sub tagline. For a limited time, we're opening up our exclusive membership program. So we have like a fear of missing out. We have the, the snob effect because it's an exclusive, exclusive limited program. And uh, to reinforce that fear of missing out, we'll add a, a countdown. So now we have people uh, pretty hooked and they're uh, ready for the, the next punch, which is the pricing table. With, of course, there's the, the cheap and crappy plan and there's the absurdly expensive plan and then the, there's the middle plan that we actually want people to get. And in addition, we're using something called uh, decoy pricing. And that's when you, not only do you use anchoring, but you intentionally, intentionally add a pricing point not because you want people to get it, just, be, just to make the other pricing points look good. So in this case, you know, nobody is going to buy the cheap and crappy plan at $77 a month. But they'll see that and they say, oh, for $20 more, uh, I could have the middle plan, which looks much better. So that's going to drive people more towards the center plan. Uh, let's get a little bit of uh, credibility with a few random company logos. And we should have a pretty uh, good landing page. Now, some people might still be immune to our uh, psychological uh, powers. So if they try to leave the page, we'll <laughs> hit them with a, a pop-up. Get a free book you'll probably never read. But, you know, it's free, so people will uh, give us their email, and then we can keep spamming them forever. So. Um, so yeah, I think there's uh, two ways to use the information I, I just shared with you. One way is like, well, to make this kind of annoying landing page with lots of tricks and, and tactics. But that, that's not really why uh, I did this talk. My goal is actually more this, defense against the, the dark arts. I believe that, you know, if you want to fight an enemy, you need to research them first. And um, it's important to be aware of these biases, first of all, so you don't fall prey to them yourself, and also so you don't use them against your own users uh, unintentionally. So, uh, well, thanks for listening. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. And, uh, thank you. Alors, la question c'est. Est-ce que j'utilise euh, les effets que j'ai décrits dans ma vie professionnelle et dans les produits que, que je fais moi-même 
J'utilise un peu, mais j'essaie vraiment de, enfin, de rester fair play et, et de ne pas faire des choses trop, euh, trop abusées quand même. Euh, donc j'ai utilisé un moment le truc de mettre le plan le, le plus cher en premier, euh, mais j'ai arrêté parce que ben ça fait des pages super longues en fait, parce que un truc auquel je n'avais pas pensé, c'est que si on met le plan, le plan le plus cher en premier, il faut mettre tout le, tout le contenu du plan, et ensuite le deuxième, ensuite le troisième. Alors que si on fait dans l'autre sens, on peut mettre juste le contenu du premier plan, et ensuite pour le deuxième, on met que ce qui est en plus, et etc. Donc ça fait quand même des trucs un peu plus, euh, un peu plus clean. Donc euh, pour le coup, j'ai donné la priorité au design plutôt que marketing, et j'ai laissé tomber l'organisation inverse. Euh, donc... Euh, mon principal projet, en fait, c'est un e-book e sur euh, Meteor, qui est un framework JavaScript. Donc, euh, des fois, on fait des, des soldes, quoi, des, des promotions. Euh, donc, effectivement, là, on utilise le Fear of Missing Out. Mais euh, dans l'ensemble, quand même, j'essaie de rester soft. Il euh, y a des trucs plus... Euh, par exemple, j'ai vu récemment un, une compagnie où leur, euh, ils proposent des landing pages. Ils appellent ça des bump sales. En fait, le produit commence à 1 dollar et il augmente d'un dollar à chaque achat. Donc euh, la première personne qui l'achète, bon, c'est 1 dollar, deuxième 2 dollars, 3 dollars. Et voilà, donc tu es, es confronté au choix, bon, est-ce que je l'achète maintenant à 100 dollars ou est-ce que j'attends et ça, ça va forcément augmenter. Moi, je trouve que ça jouait sur le stress des gens, jouait sur vraiment faire pression à ce niveau-là. Bon, j'essaye d'éviter. Je trouve, euh, après, des fois, des fois, bon, on le fait parce qu'il euh, faut, faut bien gagner sa vie et tout ça, mais... <rire> C'est un peu, bon, c'est limite, je trouve. Voilà. Ouais. Les combinaisons. Donc la question, c'est quoi les combinaisons qui marchent bien Donc tu veux dire les combinaisons entre les différents euh, effets euh, bah, Tous, hein, tu, mets, <rire> tu mets le paquet. <rire> non, euh, en général, tout ce qui est lié euh, donc à Fear of Missing Out, donc la, la peur de, de rater une occasion, je pense que c'est ça qui est vraiment le, le plus direct et le plus efficace. Donc, euh, euh, temps limité, euh, euh, par exemple, euh, ce, euh, ce cursus est disponible que pendant un mois, à que pour euh, 10 personnes, et le prix augmente euh, chaque jour. Voilà, si tu peux, <rire> c'est vraiment le, le truc où tu mets un coup de stress à la personne et tu la forces à prendre une décision là maintenant. C'est un peu ça l'idée. En fait, l'idée, c'est ça, c'est toujours de de forcer la décision le plus tôt possible parce que plus tu laisses du temps à quelqu'un pour réfléchir, surtout si ton produit n'est pas si utile que ça, bah, moins il y a de chances qu'il l'achète. Ouais, la question c'est où est-ce que j'ai appris toutes ces techniques euh, Avec un maître site euh... <rire> Non. En fait, il euh, y a un livre qui s'appelle « Thinking Fast and Slow euh, » de Daniel Kahneman. Et euh, c'est un prix Nobel de psychologie euh, qui, euh, qui a écrit ce livre où il résume un peu tout, toutes, ces, euh, toutes ces découvertes et toutes ces constatations euh, en euh, 50 ans d'études de psychologie. Et ça, ça m'a beaucoup inspiré. Il, il passe sur beaucoup d'effets. De, Après, euh, Wikipédia est aussi très utile. Il y a, il y a des pages avec euh, des listes entières d'effets de, psychologiques comme ça euh, qui sont toutes intéressantes. La question c'est, donc là j'ai parlé des effets positifs, euh, dans le sens positif pour la personne qui vend le produit, la question c'est est-ce que ça peut avoir des effets négatifs euh, Je pense, ouais. Moi, je, con, clairement, quand je vois ce genre de technique appliquée de manière trop évidente, euh, j'ai une réaction de rejet. Quoi. Je vois ça, je me dis, euh, si le produit était vraiment bien, ils n'auraient pas besoin d'en faire des tonnes, donc euh, je passe à côté. Euh, après, je pense que pour un, la plupart des gens sont quand même... Euh, pas sensibiliser à tout ça, donc ils vont, enfin pas se laisser avoir, mais ils vont se, ça va les influencer. Bon, moi aussi ça va m'influencer, hein, je ne suis pas non plus euh, un surhomme euh, <rire> euh, complètement immunisé à ça, mais euh, le fait, ouais, selon ton marché, si tu as un marché un peu plus sophistiqué, euh, si ton marché c'est les designers par exemple, ben, tu leur mets un gros truc rouge qui clignote, ça va les, <rire> ça va les refroidir tout de suite. Donc euh, ouais, je pense que c'est très important de, de connaître ton marché et de bien le cibler.
Donc la question, c'est euh, avec les, les startups qui, qui cherchent la croissance et tout ça, comment est-ce qu'on peut faire des choix éthiques euh, sans s'attaquer euh, directement au cerveau des utilisateurs Donc en ce moment, le, le growth hacking, c'est pas mal à la mode. Les gens, ils aiment bien euh, chercher des petites techniques. Euh, bon, il y a les exemples connus de Dropbox qui proposait de l'espace gratuit. Bon, ça, ça va encore, mais on peut imaginer des trucs euh, moins, moins éthiques. Moi, de ce que, que j'ai compris, le, la meilleure technique de growth hacking, c'est le bouche à oreille. Euh, toutes les startups qui ont vraiment explosé, c'est toujours à la base parce que euh, les gens euh, adorent le produit. Euh, donc, euh, voilà. Utiliser des, des trucs comme ça, euh, ça peut être bien au début pour, euh, pour dynamiser le, le début, pour avoir des bons chiffres et tout ça, mais à terme, c'est un peu une vision à court terme où tu vas, tu vas essayer de... de Ouais, d'avoir des utilisateurs faciles, mais à long terme, le seul truc qui va te faire euh, grossir, c'est le, bah, que les gens soient satisfaits, quoi, et qu'ils en parlent à, leur, à leurs amis, à leur famille, ou à leurs collègues. Donc, euh, ouais, je pense que tant que tu gardes ça en tête, ben, naturellement, le, le, le meilleur choix va être aussi le choix le, le plus éthique. Donc la question, c'est, euh, maintenant que j'ai étudié ces techniques, euh, qu'est-ce qui marche encore sur moi Est-ce que je me fais encore piéger Déjà, si je me fais piéger, probablement, je ne me rends pas compte... <rire> Donc c'est difficile de répondre. Claire, mais clairement, ce qui marche bien sur moi, c'est euh, le design, parce que je suis, je suis designer à la base. Donc, euh, bah, la, on a vu la dodo tout à l'heure avec la super page d'accueil. Ça, ça y est, j'achète. Euh, c'est des animations CSS. <rire> je regarde même pas ce que c'est le produit. Je prends. Donc, euh, c'est un peu une forme de, ben de, de halo effect où le, le, ouais, le, le design léché et la, la qualité du design va, pour moi, rejaillir sur le produit, même si, euh, bah, au final, j'en sais rien si c'est un bon produit ou pas. Euh, je ne dis pas ça pour Dodo. Hein. <rire> ça a l'air d'être un très bon produit. Donc, euh, ouais, après, par exemple, euh, la, la peur de, de rater, fear of missing out, ça, c'est un truc qui m'énerve, moi, personnellement. Donc, je pense que je me laisse moins avoir dessus. Enfin, même, euh, même quand je vais faire les soldes, maintenant, je suis là, euh, ils le vendent à 50% cette semaine, et pourquoi la semaine prochaine, euh, ça repasse à 100% quand il n'y a pas de... Quelque part, enfin... Ce qu'on veut nous faire croire, c'est qu'il y a des raisons économiques et pratiques et tout ça, pourquoi, pour le, le prix. Mais au final, c'est... Non, c'est juste... C'est ce qui rapporte le plus, donc c'est fait comme ça, mais il n'y a pas de raison. Voilà, le truc qui m'énerve beaucoup aussi, c'est le dentifrice. Pourquoi est-ce qu'il y, y a 50 sortes de dentifrice Il y a le dentifrice qui, qui lave plus blanc, et le dentifrice anti carré et il y a celui anti carré qui blanchit les dents. Euh, voilà, donc... <rire> il y a peut-être des gens qui veulent avoir les dents jaunes, mais qui n'aiment pas les caries, donc euh, bon, je ne sais pas. <rire> voilà, donc ça, typiquement, ça, ça, ça a l'effet inverse sur moi. J'essaie de prendre le dentifrice de Marc Monoprix qui ne euh, <rire> blanchit pas les dents et qui n'est pas anti-caries, mais au moins, euh, voilà. Voilà. Bah. <rire>